Okay, here's what we're going to do. With the draft this week, and we knew we were trying to get McShay, and I was in a different part of the country, but I just got back to L.A., and now Todd's back there in Bristol. I think the thing I'm most sad about is I don't get to do the going out in Hartford with Todd after the draft is done, which is one of my favorite holidays of the year. I'm, How uh, are you? I'm, I'm struggling to find someone. I know. I know. Um, well, I'll DM you something a little bit later, maybe. Maybe right. somebody that'll, that'll want to hang out. Okay. All right. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> instead of going back and forth, me asking about Calvin Ridley, is he really not a deep threat or all the things that I think about or all the Lamar Jackson stuff that we've already done. So everybody's involved. We'll do 32 teams in 32 minutes. So I will go in order of the draft, first round. If you want to throw, hey, this could all be traded. So like, give me, we'll go at one. And then as the minute goes by, I'm going to tell you we're done and we move on to the next team. That's it. Can you, can you handle that? I got it. A lot of pressure. Let's go. Okay, all right, here we go. Three, two, and one. The Browns are on the clock. This is, I mean, here we are again. Week of the draft. Don't know exactly who who the first team's taking. I think this. I think that when you go back and look at some of the quarterbacks they've had over the years, I mean, from Tim Couch to Brady Quinn to Brandon Whedon and Johnny Manziel, listen, John Dorsey doesn't, he didn't make those mistakes. He doesn't owe anyone anything, but... He knows, just like everyone else knows, you got to get the quarterback right. And that's why I think even though Saquon Barkley is a better player and higher on just about every team's board than any of these quarterbacks, they're going to wind up going with either Sam Darnold or Josh Allen. There were some, I would say, real light dustings today. of of Dustings of rumors? Dustings of rumors, (laughs) just sprinkles. Uh, Baker Mayfield, they could could still be in play. And you know what? The information, they're so tight-lipped in Cleveland that I, it would, nothing would shock me outside of them going anywhere else but quarterback. I think it should be Darnold. I think he loves John Dorsey, loves big-armed quarterbacks with big hands, especially in that, in that climate. Yep, in yep. So okay. to, to me, I think it's ultimately going to wind up being either Darnold or Allen. I think it should be Darnold. I've got a gut feeling it's going to be Allen. Whoa, there you go. Okay, a minute 12 on that one. Giants. Giants, Dave Gettleman. He values pass rushers as everyone does. I think it's the second most important part, you know, position on the team. And Bradley Chubb is sitting right there. But he's from, he's also from the, the Polian tree and has, you know, value for the running back position. And, Brian or Bill? Uh, Bill. Okay. Yeah. Just wanted to double check. And, and I think that, I think ultimately Saquon Barkley is the best player in the draft. And you sit there too. If you're going to use that pick, which I believe they are, I think they put so much value on this pick that they're looking at it and saying, you know what? We got to get, come away with a legitimate all pro, annual all pro type guy. And I think Saquon Barkley, what I'm told is that some really important people in that building love Saquon Barkley and think he's the new face of the franchise. He's a tiki barber, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I think ultimately that might went out. If Sam Darnold's sitting there, though, because Josh Allen went one, things get wow. a little trickier because I do think there are some people in the in that building banging on the uh, table for for Sam Darnold. Okay, I may have to come up with a bell here. You're doing great, though, right now. That was only Thanks. a minute ten. Uh, and feel free to throw in any trade speculation. Feel free to throw in totally irresponsible rumors. All gotcha. right, you're on the yep. clock now with the third pick, the Jets. The Jets, I've heard, have narrowed it to three, and that's why they were comfortable moving up from six to three in that trade with the Colts. The three are Sam Darnold, one. If he's there, they take him. If Darnold's gone, one or two, then I think what they're, what they're deciding between or have decided upon already is between Mayfield and Rosen. I think Rosen, they're, they're intrigued by how quickly he could get on the field, how polished he is as a, as a pocket passer. But I also think they want some mobility out of that quarterback position. I think that's why Mayfield right now, it seems like, has the edge over Rosen. Uh, but it's certainly a quarterback. They didn't move up to take any other position. And I think if Darnold's there, he's the guy. And if not, then it'll be interesting to see whether it's Mayfield or Rosen. Because if it's uh, the Rosen, Rosen's intriguing to me because I've heard so many teams linked with Mayfield. From the Jets to Denver to uh, Miami at eleven to Arizona, Arizona at fifteen. Yeah, I think Arizona likes Josh Allen a lot, a little bit more than the, you know the information that's coming out right now. But all those teams are linked to Mayfield. I don't have one outside of the Jets that there seems to be you know love for Rosen. So does that mean Rosen falls, or of teams who like Rosen have just been quiet? I I don't know. Only time will tell. Okay, Cleveland at the fourth pick. Cleveland at four is if. If it plays out like we think with, with them taking a quarterback at one, 
and then a position player at two, meaning Bradley Chubb or Saquon Barkley, and then a quarterback at three, I think Cleveland's it's very simple. They just take the other guy, Chubb or Barkley. And if it's Barkley, then they hit a, a grand slam because they get a guy in the backfield that's going to come in and and be a huge difference maker. Carlos Hyde, they brought in. He's a good player. He's underrated. But Barkley's at a different level. And then if they get another pass rusher, you team him up opposite Miles Garrett, Bradley Chubb, and then move Emmanuel Ogba, the uh, second-round pick from 2016, into a rotational role. And now you're talking about a defensive line that can be like the Eagles a year ago, like uh, Jacksonville Jaguars a year ago, like Atlanta's a couple years ago. I mean, th- that's the high-level defensive front that they would have if they are able to get Chubb at number four. Does it bother you that I was on Sports Center this fall when we were previewing NC State, Florida State, and I said, look out for Bradley Chubb, and everybody kind of looked at me weird? Does it bother me? I mean, I wish I said it before you. Yeah, sure. Hey, that's the new chime. I'm going to practice these. Oh, like All right, it. Denver, Denver, the kind fifth Kind of a pick. pathetic chime. Yeah, uh, I don't like that one, but I'm going, to, I'm going to start chiming you in a minute. Go. All right, Denver. They, from what I'm told from multiple people, there is some love in the building for Baker Mayfield. Also told that if it Bradley Chubb is there, he would be the pick. Denver values obviously pass rusher. They're another team that's had a great pass rush recently, and it's and it's been Super Bowl level. Now the question is with Denver: Are they going to trade out of that spot if Chubb's not there? Which he I, I can't imagine he will be. I just outlined he's going two or four. And so if Bradley Chubb is gone, they like some other players like a Denzel Ward, cornerback from Ohio State. I love that dude. Yeah, me too. But if if they're not going quarterback. And Chubb's gone. Are they looking to move back? And I think the answer is yes. They they would be open to it if they got a decent deal. And I think those the, the most likely team to move in would be the uh, Buffalo Bills, who are sitting at obviously twelve and twenty two, and have fifty three and sixty five and sixty. Uh, no, twelve, twenty two, fifty three, fifty six, sixty five. So five picks in the top sixty five overall. To me, I think if you can move back and take advantage of a very deep, strong draft in the second and third rounds, Denver would be smart to do so. But the Mayfield thing could be real. We'll have to see. Okay, the Colts at six. Going back to Denver, and I know I'm over the time, and I'll shorten it up on the Colts. But it's all right. But I do have different chimes I'm using. I know. I talked to I talked to a general manager who said when you look at what they just brought in, you look at Gary Kubiak what he likes in a quarterback. They obviously spent the money on quarterback uh, bringing in Case Keenum. Baker Mayfield's a better Case Keenum, and he fits what Kubiak would want to do. So that's where some of the love could be coming from. All right, Colts. Colts are simple. Move out of number, number six or stay there, and it's one of two players. I think it's Roquan Smith. They need a, a, an alpha dog the centerpiece of the defense and a, a guy who's a difference maker and Ro- Roquan Smith from Georgia is I think he's going to be Jonathan Vilma I think he's going to be an absolute star in this league and, and be the leader of your defense for decades difficult to co-host shows with yeah very difficult exactly <laughs> um, <laughs> and if it's not if it's not Roquan Smith then Quentin Nelson the guard would make sense you're trying to protect the investment and Andrew Luck, and I think they could take one of those two play, one of those two players. But the Colts, from all the teams in the top ten that are fielding calls, are the most. And I'm fielding one right now. It sounds like are the most likely to move back. They've been making phone calls, trying to get back for a, even a below average deal. They already have picked six, thirty six, thirty seven, forty nine, all in the first two rounds, and they want more. Do you want to take that call live here on the podcast? Yeah, sure. Hello. Who's this? Mark, why, why are you calling, bud? Whoa, look at McShay. Look, you want to see what? Power, what a power move that is. The team's calling I'm him, sorry, and he's like telling him off. Bud. Oh, is he from the XFL? I think someone wanted... Who's on... Uh, Will Kane? Yeah. I think they were trying to maybe call for Will Kane. Wanted to oh, that wasn't your cell? It was the studio no, phone? No, that was the studio phone, yeah. Oh, you might have screwed up Will Kane's show. It was being taped during I mean, Will Kane's show. It sounded like an eight-year-old who was scared. So I don't think it ruined the show. Well, I don't know what they're doing on that show all the time, but um, I think they... I'm looking at a monitor now. I don't think Sean they Payton. have Sean Payton as a guest, though. I think it's it's going to be it's What gonna are you be saying? Sound. You saying you can't pull the big names like you used to? Uh, no, no, I'm sure, sure he can. All right, let's go. We're but, on the clock. All right, all right, that's right. I'm sorry. These chimes suck so yeah, far. they suck, man. They do. And they I, look, I'm it. not, I wasn't heavy selling. What about keys? 
Ooh, I kind of like that okay, one. Okay, that can work. All right, so that's what we're going with from now on. Or popcorn? No. No. I like keys. John, it sounds... All right, keys. I may get sick of it, though, but all right, here we go. Let me get my time. I'm timing every one of these, so you know. Uh, here we go. On the clock, that puts us at seven, Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay, It's. I think it's safety. I think it's Derwin James. It's a name I've heard multiple times. That they, healthy enough? They love Derwin James. They think, he, James, he's, gonna, he's healthy enough. He... I think he's just underrated when you look at him, the, the football player, and what he brings. Teams are struggling with Minka Fitzpatrick because he doesn't play the true safety position. They play him near that, like that overhang where he's kind of in the box, but he's uh, he's. But out that's he like that's spot. what everybody wants from these guys, I agree. Now, isn't it? I agree. I'm just I'm just telling you. And Derwin James's workout numbers are better, and Derwin James is a more vocal leader. But with Minka, you're getting one of the smartest defensive backs to come out of the Alabama Alabama program, according to Nick and, and everyone else there. So both guys are really good players. They're both coming off the board in the top 12 to 15. Smarter than D. Milner? Smarter than D. Milner. <laughs> Smart ass. Uh, and, but I, Derwin James, is. I, I'm, you can lock that in for the final mock draft. Let's, let's put it that way. God, that was almost on the second. Okay, that puts us at uh, eight with the Bears. This is the one that everybody says is the same thing. We may need ten seconds. Quentin Nelson, although I'll say this. Well, they need they need Quentin Nelson. They need to protect their investment at quarterback, and this would be a great pick. And is obviously his offensive line coach from Notre Dame is there. Everyone's got the connection. But just don't be surprised if Chicago winds up moving back after moving up Mm. last year to go get Trubisky. Maybe moves back to twelve with Buffalo, who's been calling. Is as people like to say in my side of that recoup some of that draft equity, Todd. Collateral, yep. Right, like you don't know uh, what the hell I'm talking about or what that would mean. Okay, all right, so that was quick. Niners at nine, go. 49ers, obviously, the Reuben Foster situation adds uh, an element to it, which is it's terrible what happened, and they don't know in terms of his future, and he played great as a rookie, but there's a reason he fell to where he fell, and, and you see the character stuff. So, long short, if Roquan Smith falls here, I think that they they would love to have him. And you think back to the combine when we had John Lynch and John Gruden doing the coin flip and how pissed off John Gruden was when he lost that coin flip and he didn't want to do the interview after because he wanted to get the hell out of there. This is the reason because they very, Oakland absolutely loves Roquan Smith. And now they may not get the guy that they love because of that damn coin flip. And if you're John Lynch, now you may get the guy that you that you really need. You weren't expecting to need it, but uh, you may now. So I think Roquan Smith is the guy. If not, then look defensive back. Minka Fitzpatrick would make some sense here. And, um, and Denzel Ward in this scenario is still on the board, too. So I think it would be defense for the Niners, very likely to be Roquan Smith if he's there. And then if not, then I would say Fitzpatrick and Ward would be the two. Okay, then Oakland, as you said, they're at 10. You think that that Gruden, it was just because of... Of Roquan, or do you think it was because he hates being in the media? Like now, he hates the media now that he's not in it. Uh, I think it was losing the pick. Okay, you know what? That's not why you're on. No. People don't want to hear your theories. They want to hear what the Raiders are going to do. My theories on what the Raiders are going to do is that Roquan Smith's there. Take him. If not, which we don't expect him to be at all. Um, then I, I think you're looking at Tremaine Edmonds from Virginia Tech and Vita Vea are two of the names I've heard they have have serious interest in. But to be totally honest with you, the guy, the information I'm getting, it's not John, and I think John is working with his staff, but ultimately kind of knows what his board is, and I'm not sure that everyone else in the building knows. Let's put it that way. Yeah, no, I have NBA teams that do that, where they they tell me all this stuff, and then when draft day comes around, they always every source I have, the team does something different from what my information is every year. Yeah, and there's certain well, teams. He, just, like, he, he went rogue. He didn't. We, right. didn't, we didn't know he was going to do that. That's the that's the phone call I expect to get the you know the day after the draft. Okay, Miami at eleven. Miami's interesting because they're I, the quarterback thing is real. Wait a but, minute, that they would move up, or no, if somebody no, no, fell no, to no, them? Well, I'm saying the interest in quarterback is real, and I do believe Baker Mayfield is a guy that really intrigues them. But I do not think that they're willing to part with picks. They realize that they have multiple needs to fill, and that they have a quarterback if he could just stay healthy that they can win with. And I believe that to be true as well. So, you know, you got Ryan Tannehill if. Mayfield falls to 11. I think that they would pull the trigger. If not, I think I think that they're just going to stay home and, and best available, if you will. So Vita Vea would make a lot of sense with Adamic and Sue departing. 
I, I also think they're just on the defensive side, they've got a, a bunch of holes to fill and offensive line as well, too. I, I think they could continue to try to upgrade that group. Wow, that was perfect. You're getting great at this. Okay, 12, the Bills. The Bills are trying like crazy to move up. And, you know, they, and it's for a quarterback, right? Of course. It, absolutely. I'd heard that a month ago. Well, they moved up to, to number 12 already in the deal with Cordy, sending Cordy Glenn away. And I wonder if they would make that deal. Well, they knew about uh, Wood and then Incognito. Right, so they're missing three parts of their offensive line. Yeah, three. They're three best parts of their offensive Incognito, line. Incognito, I think, is in Manhattan Beach. I've seen him when oh, I've been boy. walking around. I know. Do you think that'd be a good fit? I think. I think if you see him in the same bar, you should probably just go find somewhere else. You, you, you don't two, think he and I would get along? The, the meat, the meathead fest that you two are with a few drinks. <laughs> Ooh, I can picture some bad stuff. All right. So anyway, wait a minute. Never mind. Uh, Buffalo then. So moving Buffalo's up. trying to move up. I think that they Is would, it because Josh Allen's hand size and it, the cold throws I that he's it, accustomed to, that Laramie Plains wind? I think it's part of it, smartass. I do. Um, you go back and look at <laughs> it, look at a study of all the quarterbacks that have won a Super Bowl in the last 10, I think it's 10 years or so. It, all of them have 9 and 7 eighths inches or, or bigger. So No, the hand thing I think is real, but I was reading something else that was like based on the Laramie wind currents that it was very similar to what you faced in Buffalo. Yeah, you can and you're cut, like, cut through the wind. Right, no, I mean, right. he can, like, but if it, no one else... can, he, he, can he play? You've, that's what you got to... That's the other thing, yeah, because he's any good. Figure out, but, um, um, but with I think Allen would be legitimately, you know, the, the target if they move up. But they're I don't think they're getting to two. So if it's not two, then we're talking about five with Denver would be the first spot. Six is the most likely I think to Indianapolis. And as I mentioned before, the, I know that the Bears have fielded calls uh, for for a team moving up. I don't know specifically the Bills, but I have to assume. Now I'll also mention Arizona sitting out there at fifteen. The Chargers have been awfully active, although I don't think they're going to wind up drafting a quarterback. They had every quarterback in. They've had every quarterback in. New England has picks 23 and 31. I don't know what the hell the Bills are going to do. I know. I'm just saying that. So there's a lot of teams trying to move up. So if you're the Bills, you have to realize there could be. I shouldn't say there are a lot. There could be other teams. So you can't take it for granted and you can't wait till pick 10 to go up again ahead of Miami. I hear the bell. So I, I think that that's what they're dealing with now. And if it's not quarterback, then. Shoot, I mean, they offensive line uh, what becomes the number one priority, right? And then you're kind of in that middle thing, though. If Nelson's gone, and then you go, all right, yeah, Mike keep... McGlinchey, yeah, McGlinchey is that? Are we reach in there? Reaching, okay, yeah. okay, all right. Never mind. I got to stop myself. The Redskins. I'm hearing Des Bryant to the Redskins. No, that they would just draft him and then go. Oh, wait a minute, wrong night. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I'm hearing. Uh, so we're we're good on the, what else? Next, what, B le- the what B level Reman? <laughs> Go ahead. What do you have? Uh Vita Vea, nose tackle. Deron Payne, nose tackle. There I mean this team's always drafting a nose tackle or a guard, right? Feels like it. I mean Jonathan Allen last year. Ryan Allen. Ryan Anderson was the second round pick. Uh, they had Josh Dotson, I guess, from two years ago. That class is gone. Sua Cravens, Kendall Fuller, Nate Sudfield, Stephen the whole Daniels, class, yeah, the whole class is gone. Brandon Scherf was the guard year before, so it was it was linebacker and offensive tackle in fourteen, guard in the end in fifteen, wide receiver and a backer that's gone in sixteen, and then defensive tackle, outside backer, and they still have needs on on the defensive side. They're, I mean, I'm looking at their needs right now: nose tackle, guard, center, and thirty four outside backer. So. I don't know. It's it's an interesting team. And they have to they have to hit it again this year after getting a good pick in Jonathan Allen. It won't surprise me if it's in the defensive front or the offensive line. Packers at fourteen. Packers need an edge rusher. I think you know everyone's mocked him there, but uh, Davenport coming out of UTSA it would be. I think a pretty good fit at this point. What's up with this group of edge guys from schools no one's heard of? Because it feels like we don't have the classic edge guys from the big boy programs that we're used to. Is that fair? Yeah, it is mostly fair. I I think, you know, you've got obviously Chubb, and then there's a drop-off, and then you've you've got Davenport coming out of Texas San Antonio, Marcus Davenport. He reminds me of Ezekiel Ansah for Detroit. He's raw. He doesn't know exactly what he's doing yet. Uh, but he's got he's just long. He's six five and a half, two hundred seventy pounds. He ran in a four six, which is what a running back runs in the forty yard dash and you know thirty four inch arms. This guy's got the tools to be really good. But after that, there's a drop off, and it's you know it's Harold Landry who struggled this past year with an ankle from BC and under kind of undersized guy for three four backer. 
So I, you know, when you, you look at the rush class, there's certainly a, a uh, drop off there. But Green Bay specifically needs offensive line. They need a, an outside backer, which is what this would accomplish. I think wide receiver and then cornerback is another spot that I think that they could they could be looking, even though they spent a, a second round pick in Kevin King last year. Okay, fifteen Arizona. Arizona is kind of lying in the weeds, and I know some people in that yeah, organization are. love Josh Allen. And I know, and I've heard some people, I don't know, I don't know, but I've heard some people, and even read it, I think, today on the Monday Morning Quarterback with Peter King that they have interest in Baker Mayfield. So when you put those two things together, and you, you consider the fact that they're starting quarterbacks right now, their top two quarterbacks are Sam Bradford and Mike Glennon, I don't know, man. I, I think that they could legitimately look into giving away a, a first-round pick next year and trying to move up to go get their guy ahead of the Bills, ahead of... Uh, ahead of Miami at eleven, somewhere in that six to or five to ten range. Wow, we don't even need the extra time there. Okay, let's go with Baltimore at sixteen. This is the first time. Well, I guess at fifteen with with Arizona, but fifteen, sixteen. This is kind of the range you start to get into Lamar Jackson. And I don't know that which team is looking to pull the trigger, but I do think he would be a fascinating fit in New England. I think he'd be a fascinating fit in New Orleans. I think teams like Arizona and Baltimore will, will strongly consider and just and tailoring things to, to his, his game. But if it's not quarterback for Baltimore, I think Baltimore sitting there, they know they brought in a receiver um, today, and they're trying to get as many needs taken care of so they can t- take best uh, player available. They brought in, who's Baltimore brought in? Crabtree? Michael Crabtree, John Brown. Um, and then they. Wait a minute, was it Sneed? Sneed, yeah. Yeah, today. Sneed. So now that's three receivers. So it tells you that they don't quite value this receiver class, which is kind of in was, line. Yeah, right. I mean, it's pretty bad. I mean, we have. Calvin even... Ridley and DJ Moore are right. the top two guys, and, and you'd ideally and like both to take them. them in the 20s. Yeah, right. We'll go back and so, study it. I'm not going to waste all of Baltimore's time, but from 2014 through 2017, the wide receiver production of first round receivers has been terrible. Everyone's focused on height, weight, speed, and all those other things, not route running. Juju Smith shoots. Is the best receiver as a rookie last year. Runs in the high four fives, and he's the best route runner in the class. Cooper Cup runs a four six two. Gets drafted in the third round, I think. Yeah, but he's deceptively fast. And he, yeah, faster in, soft, in space. Soft hand. So Baltimore. Soft my point is, re- if it's not Lamar, player. I, I don't think it's going to be wide receiver. I think they could move back. I also think tight end, if they move back, would make a lot of sense with Hayden Hurst or Dallas Goddard. Do you think that they would? Have you said Austin Ward yet? By the way, who? Have you said Denzel Ward? Denzel, sorry. Yeah, Austin we said him. Um, yeah, but you didn't really plug him in anymore. No, Denver would be the first spot at number yeah. five, but I think I think somewhere in that five to ten range. Austin, who am I kidding? Mm-hmm. Uh, no, Denzel, because I wanted to just follow up on him that like people knock him for the lack of production thing. I don't know, man. I, I don't like. I wonder how many people really just watch on Saturdays, and I don't watch the way you do. But like, whenever you watch Ohio State, you just go, "Yeah, he's awesome." He's like, got some Antoine some, Winfield to him. Something's different there, right? You know, he's well. First of all, he's un, I mean, he's a twitched up freak. He's, yeah, that's what. Yeah, he's a, I know he's slight, a, a legendary uh, workout warrior in the weight room. Like the numbers he puts up, and yeah, he's five eleven. He's one hundred and eighty five pounds, but he ran a four three two, and he'll hit you. I, I mentioned Antoine Winfield, former Ohio State corner, a small who guy who will who will hit you. Was, yeah, but God, maybe I'm forgetting Winfield. Winfield wasn't. Yeah, I guess you're right, man. He was pretty skinny. He was undersized, yeah. And but and he, he was, was good. And, oh, yeah, yeah he was damn good. He wasn't Dante Hitner, but Hitner was uh, Whitner was a safety. <laughs> I just always thought that was clever. Okay, all right. Sorry. So I, I kind of I got all out of sorts. I was thinking about the kid Austin from the Yankees, a sucker punch a Sox guy last week. I'm, I'm still kind of upset about that. I miss your brain, so, man. It's just that it's all over yeah, the place. Yeah, it's all over the place. So, all right, moving on. Um, I gave that. That was the chime was for me. The uh, My other team here in L.A., now that my kings are out of it, McShea, yep. which sucks. Although when you're walking around Manhattan Beach trying to find a place to have a beer and a dinner and watch some NBA playoff games and the kings are on, good luck. Like That's like going to Mexico, asking them to change the channel from soccer to American Idol. Like nobody, everybody's like, peace. Yeah, um, I mean, real world problems right there, bud. Yeah, right, right. Not trying to, these aren't not complaints. These are just observations. Okay. All right. So, uh, the Chargers, yeah, you said it a little bit earlier. And I was reading some stuff prepping up for this earlier that, yeah, they've had all these, these different dudes come in. I could see Philip Rivers playing forever. Forget Brady at 45. I say Rivers at 50. 
I think he's got two years left. Let's put it that way. But I, yeah, I, he I, talks I, about retiring. I think a lot. Geno like, Smith's a backup. Cardell Jones is the backup to the backup. I, I don't think that they're going to use a first round pick on a quarterback. I will be surprised, but it's a quarterback, so we'll see. If not, I think nose tackle. This is where you could see Vita Vey if he starts to fall a little bit from Washington. Deron Payne from Alabama. Um, they they lack a lot. Linebackers that make plays, really. I mean, you look at this line with Bosa. Mebane's getting older. Corey Legit is is okay, but they've got Melvin Ingram. Ingram's opposite, awesome. Uh, yeah, opposite Bosa. They need a guy that off the line linebacker that can make some plays. Rashawn Evans. It might be too early for him at this point, but I, I think safety is another spot. If if somehow Minka were to fall, I think that this would be a, a perfect landing spot. But um. You know, those are a few of the positions I think they're looking for, primarily on the defensive side. An offensive tackle could be, like a Mike McGlinchey if he was there at that point, because Russell Kung is um, – well, he, he came in to help. You have Bark Stills under contract, but, uh, but he's uh, – yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Offensive tackle could be a spot they, they address in the first few rounds. Seahawks. Uh, I would say – uh, team that you would go, I want to be just like them in the draft, and then you start looking at it going, you know, it hasn't been great um, recently, which is not me saying, hey, they're not good or they were overrated, because that group that they put together on that defense is, was one of the all-time runs. All-time. Uh, you know, no, if you, you look were, at, listen, there's one player... Is that se- fair? Is it fair to say, like, wait a minute, we give them so much credit for such a long time, we stop paying attention to the fact that, like, they need a hit here. In the 28 picks they had in 2013, 14, and 15... Frank Clark, Tyler Lockett, and Justin Britt are the only players still on the roster. So, you know, they and, wow. and last, Fetty from 2016 hasn't been hasn't been everything that, that they were hoping he would be. Malik McDowell is likely Michigan on, State kid, yeah, yeah, who had the accident and, and likely will be out of football very soon. So, uh, you know, this is the, they've had some hard luck. They yeah, that's not on the front up. But so I mean, you yeah, know, but but, it, but they took a risk, and yeah. I, and it's a risk I would have taken. I said it at the time, and I would have been wrong just like they were. But you know, that's what they've they've been dealing with. And at the end of the day, they've got to get. But you know, they, Ethan Pochick at um at center was an eleven game starter. Shaquille Griffin, who's Shaquem Griffin's brother, was a, a third round pick and a starter. So they typically on the defense. Yeah, the corner. Side, been, that's yeah. why they that's why they made some decisions on corner because they liked him so much. He was better. So Right. So this yeah. year, what do All they right. need? They need offensive line again. Um Abushi opened eight games at right guard. Jokel made eleven starts at left guard. And they're both unsigned. DJ Fluker's gonna start at right guard. You know, they've just got a bunch of guys moving in and out. No one listened to me on Fluker. And Afedi led the league in, with sixteen penalties a year ago. So <laughs> you know Did we did we give him a name? Who? Seahawks. We just we talked a lot about him. Okay, I think offensive line, McGlinchey is a possibility. Will Hernandez, uh, guard. I think it on the defensive side, corner could be a possibility, like a Mike Hughes or a Josh Jackson. All right, the Iowa kid. All right, because some people have him going even harder. All right, so let me keep moving here. Number 19, Dallas Cowboys. 19, I think defensive tackle is a possibility. I think Taven Bryan would be a, a good fit for Dallas. They've... They need. They've really upgraded their off or their defensive line and their pass rush specifically the last couple of years. But I think the interior could continue to improve. Wide receiver becomes a, a high priority, and so now you're sitting there at 19. And do they like Calvin Ridley? Do they like DJ Moore? Those would be the top two options, in my opinion. I've heard a lot about Cortland Sutton from SMU. I think that's probably more so because everyone yes. in the office went to. Went over to the workout at SMU, and and Trey Quinn was working out too, and they've got um, they've got some other players. So I, I, there's this big link there with with uh, Sutton and Dallas, and I just I'm, I'm not sure I'm buying it. Good job there. All right, Detroit number twenty. Detroit's another team. I think defensive tackle would make sense. I just mentioned Taven Bryan. Uh, if it's not Bryan, they guard center. This is a really good guard center class with James Daniels from Iowa being. Uh, I think the top guy at center at guard, you've got Will Hernandez, as I mentioned, coming after Quentin Nelson. So there, there's a lot of depth here, but I, I think those are a couple of positions to look at. I think in round or round two, day two, running back could be a, a spot they look at. Amir Abdullah, the fumbles, and, and just has not been as productive as I thought he was going to be. I really liked him in 2015 coming out. LeGarrette Blunt is there for just his, the Blunt role. And so now I think in day what? two, when you when – you, <laughs> When you look at some of the running backs that could be there from Sony Michelle, Georgia, Nick Chubb, also Georgia, Darius Geis, LSU, Ronald Jones from USC, Carrion Johnson, Auburn, 
um, Rashad Penny from uh, San Diego State. You got a bunch of dudes in the second round, second third round range where I think Detroit could find find another back to come in and compete. Okay, um, do you like Quinn, their GM? By the way, he's about our age. He's from New England too. Yeah, yeah. It, do you know him well? I don't know him well, but I don't. I'm surprised I, you guys don't hang out more. He's well respected, and he's he done, he's done a good job. Okay, all right. Cincinnati at 21. Since he's now getting linked to from multiple people, I saw it in Peter Lamar, King, but right? Lamar Jackson. Yeah, and I got another text today. Don't 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 rule out Baltimore or Cincinnati when it comes to Lamar. So um, it's something to keep an eye on. Center's probably their biggest need. I think that they this James Daniels is a, a good possibility here. Linebacker, they need playmakers. Vontez is now, you know, out another four games with suspension. Yeah, but you don't get it. You don't understand it. He's misunderstood. Yeah, he is misunderstood. They brought in Preston Brown, but I, I just I think this team could use another linebacker. I think defensive tackle is another area. So those are kind of the top spots that I would look for. But the quarterback thing's intriguing because Andy Dalton has he plateaued. Wow, I didn't even think of that. Plateau is such a perfect word for it. Excellent. Okay, uh, Bills again at 22. Well, do they get their quarterback? And if they did, then then all is good. And they likely gave away either this pick or they gave away their two second-round picks. And people love the second, third, and fourth round this year, right? Yeah, it's very deep, especially especially second, third. So uh, when you look at it after that, linebackers... My information area. on the fourth was bad then. No, it, it's good. It, okay. Some portion of the fourth, yeah. Uh sure. I think, I think that they could go. They brought in a center. They're kind of covered there. They could go linebacker. They could go right tackle. Um, they could go wide, bring in another wide receiver. So there, there's a bunch of different areas that they could go with. I think guard, linebacker, and offensive tackle are the the top few. Okay, nice work. I don't even need the bell on this one. So that leaves us uh, with the Pats first time on the board here. This is the uh, the Rams trade here. 23. Again, how how interesting would it be if Lamar Jackson was here and had time to develop in the back end? Um, but I, What are you talking about, New England? Yeah. Like the, my only knock on him, and we've already done this, is that I just thought it was funny that the easy throws were so inaccurate so often. And yeah, there's a, there's a, up it's and down weird. Hey, but I think you can I think you can improve him, and I don't think because of it, what he brings, I don't think he has to be awesome. I, I just worry he's got to go somewhere where they can coach and they're creative and they can. They can make the progression reads. They can make it easier on him and give him tips to to help him. Hey, and, when you were watching him run, okay, yeah. I'm going to ask you this though, because like this is a great example. And I'm going to get rid of the chime here for a second because I, I think this is important. Is that RG3 clearly never knew how to slide, and he could well, not RG3 protect was himself. A straight line runner. Right. He was but never like, a, a twitchy guy. You would think after you get your ass handed to you a few times that you would then go, okay, maybe I should stop doing that thing where I get slaughtered out here. And then the first throw or that first game where he's with the Browns, he doesn't step out of bounds to the right, gets blasted in the shoulder, and then he's done again. And you go, all right. When I watched Lamar in college, I don't know if he can slide or not because I don't think anybody ever got a clean angle on the guy. Like right. when DeAnthony Thomas was at Oregon – I don't ever remember watching him get hit. I'm not sure there's a clip somewhere of him getting hit clean, but what I'm saying is for the most part, he was just quicker than you. He was quicker than all you guys. It looked like he was going to score every single time. That's what Vilma so like, was saying today about, about Vic, that, that all the other guys he could track down and could get it. He, just, he couldn't run down Vic, and he couldn't try, you know, in the open it, field. But, but Vic did it on Sunday. So I'm talking about two dudes on Saturday, whereas, you know, you watch the Anthony Thomas Oregon go, oh my God, you know, and then, you know, you, you, you forget who he is, you know, even though he's been able to stay in the league for a little bit. Now Lamar's going to have the ball more. My, my point would be like, have you seen anything from him that, that shows that he'll know how to protect himself or is it just that he never had to, so he didn't even know? Um, I've seen it, but he gets out of bounds. That's what he does. That's his, yeah. his thing a lot is that he kind of sees it coming and he'll, he'll step out of bounds. I just can't believe how many times he'd run up inside yeah. of stuff. And like the short goal line thing. He's two hundred ten pounds, legitimately. He's not. He's you know. How he, tall is he though? He's <laughs> six three. But okay, all right, he's good. He's Cam growing. Newton. Cam Newton is uh. Okay, well, forget that. Five pounds. That's different. You and I sat next to each other for two, or stood next to each other for two of his sideline games, and there was that national championship again game against Oregon. He ran it to the left side, one on one with a set guy in secondary, and juked him. And you blame. Yeah. yeah. And you no, just, and Cam, I mean, but I'm, my point is, it, at 210, 215 pounds, you're not staying healthy in that league if Cam Newton at 255 no. pounds is taking a similar 
type beating of, now, beating. and we got to worry about him every single day. Right, and, and yeah. his trouble, having trouble staying healthy. So I, I think he's going to have to adjust his game in the NFL to have success, and that's why I wanted him to go somewhere where he doesn't have to play right now. He can continue to bulk up, and he's going to have people who utilize him properly and can learn. Okay. All right, All right so... There we go with the Patriots. So Patriots that's the need Pats. a left tackle for Nate Solder. They need an edge rusher. They need a cover linebacker. Rashawn Evans would make a lot of sense. We'll cover the, this pick and 31 so so that it's done with. I think Rashawn Evans would make sense maybe at 31 if he's still available from Bama because they need that cover linebacker. Mike McGlinchey would make sense. I'm not a huge Colton Miller fan, both at left tackle. McGlinchey and Miller coming out of UCLA. But uh, in terms of measurables, this guy has it all and can be developed. And Dante Scarnecchia is one of the best teachers at the offensive line position in the league. So it might work out at, uh, in New England if, if they wind up getting Miller. So those are a few names for New England at 23 and 31. Yeah, whatever. Tight end UNH. All right. Uh, Carolina at 24. Carolina can always use another weapon. Carolina can use an edge rusher. Carolina. Yeah, they really don't like their receivers. They don't put a lot into that. And then when they have them, I mean, you know, not to say that Benjamin was the easiest dude commitment wise, right? Um, yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm talking out loud. I'm in a, no, never mind. This is for me. My bad. Guard, they lost, uh, Norwell to Jacksonville. Safety, they, they need to get younger. They need a difference maker. Kurt, Kurt Coleman started 42 games over the last three seasons. He's, he's gone. So you got a strong safety in Mike Adams, who's 37. I think safety could be a spot here for um, for Carolina. Again, they need they could use another rusher. They could use a couple different positions, wide receiver. But I think safety would be a, an interesting spot for them. I, I like Justin Reed out of Stanford. Might be a little too early. Okay, Ten, uh, Tennessee at twenty five. Tennessee needs an edge rusher. I think above all else, I think they need to find a guy who can come in and and um, and just get pressure off the edge and and disrupt. They just don't have that guy. And you look at this year's class, and I, I, there's a big drop-off. If Davenport were to fall here to number 25, I think it would be an absolute no-brainer. I don't know that he will. I think you're probably having to make a tough decision on a guy like Harold Landry who has the measurables and has flashed. Did it in 2016, but this past year wasn't the same guy. Um, I think it, But with Arakpo's aging, Derek Morgan's Derek Morgan, Eric Walden, those guys, he had four sacks a year ago. They've, they've got to find an edge rusher if they can. If not, then I think inside linebacker and guard, offensive t- guard, right tackle would be, um, would be another area for depth. Okay, Atlanta at pick 26. It's another team defensive tackle. I don't know. The problem is, after the first few with Vea and, and um, Payne and Taven Bryan from Florida, the, it really it kind of drops off. I think then you, you go in the second round with like Harrison Phillips from San, Stanford, B.J. Hill from NC State. There's this kid, Nathan Shepard from Fort Hayes State. Uh, but Atlanta, I think defensive tackle would be one of the positions that they're going to try to address early. Guard, wide receiver, tight end, I think for more for depth. But I think guard and wide receiver would be the two spots that they would, they would look if it's not defensive tackle. Number 27, the Saints. Saints, I'd love to see Lamar here. It's becoming the Lamar podcast. I just think it would be the, the perfect fit. If it's not, I think that they're looking at tight end as a possibility. And right now you probably have Hayden Hurst from South Carolina and Dallas Goddard. Uh, Hurst a little bit more explosive, but 25, 26 years old. And Goddard coming out of the small school level, absolutely dominant. And he's the rare two-way tight end where he can play in line and can detach and, and go catch the ball, but not quite as explosive as, uh, as Hurst. Okay, Pittsburgh at 28. Remember this. They're going to want somebody who's good. They have a good front office, but they want him in two years before an important playoff game to complain about his contract or his touches. You and Kuiper with the, the me, 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 selfish, selfish, selfish. Well, I mean, at this point, it's true. Yeah. It's, it's a joke. Well, obviously, Ryan. It's too bad because it's an awesome team. Ryan Shazier's injury. Yeah, that's the worst part. The worst. He's, he's out of that group. And so now you have to look at that. I've mentioned Rashawn Evans a few times at inside backer. Um, if it's not there. I think in the second round, there there's going to be some pretty good options. This linebacker class is not bad at all. Um, I like the kid out of South Carolina State, Darius Leonard, who can run and chase. Um, Fred Warner from BYU is another possibility on day two. So inside backer, cornerback, seven touchdown passes of 40-plus yards, most in the NFL last year. They've got a... They've just got to upgrade that position. Joe Hayden isn't the guy he used to be. Artie Burns has been a 2016, I don't want to say bust, but he has not played to that level. So corner and inside backer, safety is another spot. 
Jacksonville at 29. Jacksonville, Jacksonville's all offense, really. I mean, they've tried to upgrade. Have you had Ridley going anywhere yet? Yeah, I had, I had Ridley to a couple potential spots. But Baltimore, right. Baltimore probably not. Anymore. Carolina. No. Carolina was a possibility. Hey, is Ridley, like my whole thing on Ridley, like, you know, my friends that ask me about it, and they go, you know, because they're only thinking about their fantasy and they're freaking out there's no receivers, right, for keeper leagues. Mm-hmm. So this is, man, by the way, there should be a dork chime here. Um, there we go. Um Ridley was, what, 19 as a freshman in Alabama. And I don't remember what his 40 time is. You can give it to us here in a second. 4 4 eight. Wow. See, that's still faster than people talk about. No, it. it actually might have been 442. Damn, really? Because yeah. then now, everybody's now, like, no, all right. His, his shuttles were terrible. His yeah, vertical right. and broad jump were terrible. He ran a 443. Sorry. 443. Okay. Faster than you would think, maybe, that the way well, people he's built talk on, about him. He's built on speed and quickness. And he's. But here's what I think is that when he went up for a ball, he won all the time. He wins a lot, and he. That's what impresses me the most out of him. He's not the biggest. Runner. He's not the he's fastest. The best route runner, and this he's is the, what's the difference every year. I talked to you. I just told you, Juju Schuster, the whole deal. This guy. So is he a up. black Cooper Cup? Yeah, sure. A little bit better. <laughs> okay, it's <laughs> a good one. <laughs> Perfect. You can use that this week. You Nailed it. Will you please use that on one Sports Center? Uh, I might have to. That's good. That's <laughs> Actually, good. don't. 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 Don't use well, no, it. No, it's I don't perfect to... because if I get in trouble for it or something comes of it, I can just blame you. And if, if not, I'll look like uh, if, if it, yeah, humor, if, then I'll, I'll take. Yeah, it if somebody goes, wait a minute, what's wrong with that? That's actually kind of I don't know. Like, is that bad? Um, <laughs> all right, that leaves us uh, thirty with the Vikings. Three more picks to go. Vikings offensive line, but you got to realize too when you look at their roster, they've got three players who are going to be up next year. Anthony Barr, I'm not sure they're going to be able to resign. They've got um, uh, Daniel Hunter, who's going to be up, and Sheldon Richardson. And now they're, this isn't the same team now that they've gone all in on a quarterback in terms of the salary cap with Kirk Cousins. So they've got to start planning ahead and making sure that they're, they're covered on the backside with young, young players. So I think while offensive line is the obvious one, they're looking for a versatile lineman who can play guard or tackle. Um, I think James Daniels would be a home run um, if it's not in the first round, could it be like a Billy Price if he falls a little bit or uh, uh, the kid from Nevada who's getting a lot of attention in the second round? Um, Brandon, no, sorry, Austin Corbett. So I think offensive line, but don't be surprised if it's defensive front seven because they, they need to stay out ahead. Okay, the Pats we pick did, 31. We did Pats 31 already. We covered both. Lamar Jackson again. Uh, <laughs> the last pick here then, your Super Bowl champs, the Philadelphia Eagles. They're going to trade out. They don't have a second or third round pick. I want to say. Yeah, they don't. They don't. And, they don't pick again until you know, these guys are really. These guys are good. Joe Douglas, Andy Weidel, you know, along along with Howie Roseman, they they get it. And so I, I think they'll do anything they can to move back and get additional picks and and get more value uh, out of the draft. But if they're stuck or even in in you know early in the second round, I, I think when you look at them, linebacker could be a spot. But I think more wide receiver, guard, tackle. Tight end could be some spots that they look. All right. I want to... Uh, that was a lot just, in 32 minutes, man. No, we did it. We did it. Uh, let me look at my timer here. We went a little over, but I think it is maybe the fastest 32 minutes. Whew. That's a, in, as fast as I've talked in a long time. Yeah, but wasn't that better? Yeah. I liked it because it kept you locked in. And you got... It was weird because you almost in your head, you were stopping after a minute, even without even, you know, the chime. Mental clock, incredible, bro. Uh, you did a thing. They did an oral history of the mock draft on Sports Illustrated, which was awesome for people that love mock drafts and, and want to know how this thing all started. I thought and I signed I, up for 32 minutes or so. I know. But <laughs> can joking. you just... I'm, I'm doing this. You can only take a minute here because I just think it's so important for people that don't like you, because everybody gets mad at the mock drafters, and I'm, I'm constantly, like, I have all my friends, they're like, oh, Mel's stupid, Todd doesn't know anything. I'm like, do you guys realize that, like, this is like your bracket, like, everyone in your office except for one dude, and everybody else is like, oh, my bracket sucks. You're like, well, that's kind of the game. Right. So, when you put out your mock for 2019, and everybody gets mad at you for doing it, I thought it was great that your quote, essentially, and you can just take a minute on this and we'll let you bounce, on how much you uh, hate doing it, I do because I don't you know, like. I joke around about it. I, I first of all, I think it's ridiculous we're doing a mock that uh, a year in advance. But Se- secondly, and, and more importantly, I I hate misleading 
guys that are that this is like the most important thing in their life. And I hate the feeling of putting down these 32 names and knowing that I haven't done tape on them. Yeah, I've seen them like in games and and I've caught a couple plays. Dude, one right of there. your quotes was incredible. Like you said, "Oh, I put this guy at 15 and then you started watching his tape." Yeah, no, and I you're mean, like, "Oh no." I put a, a, a Minnesota quarterback in at 32 because Joey, Is that Mitch? Cuz Joey Roberts was like, "Hey, this guy could be a Car- Carson Wentz sneaker uh, uh, you know, sneak into the late first round, or he could be kind of a sleeper. He's got great intangibles. I, I had seen him throw the ball like five times. I just, I, I, I go and then watch tape like three weeks later. How bad did you freak out when you watch? And this I is what Mitch Ledner, sick, Mitch, Mitch Leidner, Leidner, Leidner. I, I was even sick his name. to my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is like sixth round at best. If he, if he develops, if he has a great year. And this sounds bad for the. I, no, I'm thinking then, about but, you, and you're going. I, mean, I know how much time you put into this, and I can't. And like I care when we get closer. I, know you do. I want to have right. the. I want to have the 32, but I don't want to mislead a guy who's legitimately looking and saying, "Should I leave early, or should I sign up with an agent and and take out a bigger loan because I think I'm going to be a first, second round pick?" Now, when we get closer and you and you get to the decision making process, we've watched tape on these guys, and there's more information. But I don't want to get it in the guy's head summer before he goes into his junior or senior year, and now he starts thinking about the draft stuff when he really shouldn't be thinking about that, or he thinks he's a first round pick when he's really a fifth, sixth round pick, or an undrafted free agent. So I, I'm surprised at how many guys we get that actually wind up in the first couple rounds. But I, there's always one or two guys a year where I go back and I just cringe because I hate the fact that I, I had to put my name on something that I just haven't done the work on, and there's no way to do the work on it because you're working up to that moment on the, the previous year's draft. And it's the most viewed thing you do all That's year That's the correct? kicker. That's the right. real kick in the you know what's. Hey, uh, you know how much uh, I appreciate this and know how busy you are, but you, uh, I really Thanks, do. Brother. It's not just because you're my friend. I think you're the best that does this. I, don't, I appreciate I mean, you. I, I really do. And it's, it's not even close. Here, I'm going to call you wondering where the hell to go eat and what to do on uh, Sunday. Yeah, Sunday night. I'll tell you to hit up Love and Salt. Done. Get on a plane. All right, man. Talk to you soon. Later. Okay, so that's Todd McShay. You can see his coverage and all the stuff in the drafts that he will have up on ESPN.com, which I could not access here in L.A. because I don't have a login, but not a big deal. We've got a bunch of NBA stuff coming up here, but I feel, I don't know, I feel like Simmons loves the greenie teases so much when I do the Simmons pod, and I'm doing a big one with him on Thursday for the playoffs, that if then I do kind of a fake greenie tease, then I'm kind of not really stealing from greenie, I'm stealing from Simmons, but I still have to come up with a tease. That's a dilemma, Saruti. I mean, people in the biz love the greenie teases, so. Especially managers. Um, I mean, I don't know. Even though Simmons does it, I feel like I'm the one that had to actually do teases back in the day. Uh, all right. Well, here's, here's, I won't do a greenie tease yet until I've, I, I need a further, I need to spend more time on this. So I will do, uh, five things from the NBA and run through the playoff stuff. And obviously there's one game I can't wait for. See, I couldn't even help myself. I did it anyway. Let's talk about Simply Safe. Big news in the last two weeks. Simply Safe won Editor's Choice Awards from CNET Magazine, PC Magazine, and The Wire Cutter. Three respected product testers. They put Simply Safe through a battery of tests compared to other home security products. Simply Safe won every time. I've been telling you about Simply Safe on my radio show, now here on the podcast for a while. My opinion, it's the best home security system hands down. They protect over 2 million Americans. This is a home security system you actually want in your home. And trust me, I had one that I didn't want. It was the worst. It used to go off all the time. I had to call some guy in Tennessee to disconnect it, and then I got Simply Safe. The sensors are tiny. You're not going to notice them. It's unbelievably easy to use. You can control it right from your phone. But here's the most important reason. This isn't a gadget. It's comprehensive protection for all of your windows, your doors, your entire home. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Professional alarm monitoring there for you around the clock is just $15 a month. No contracts. No one else is doing it like this. Learn more. About how Simply Safe can help protect your home. Go to simplysafe.com slash Ryan, R Y E N. That's simplysafe.com slash Ryan, R Y E N. Everyone in the neighborhood knew about Bobby. Bobby, the basketball boy, they called him. Bobby wanted to go pro someday, so he was always out in the driveway shooting hoops. But one day, his mom came out and told him, Hey, your wife wants you to take out the trash? His mom was visiting, and Bobby was a grown man. He had kind of missed his window. Plus, no one had ever seen him actually make a basket. 
But on the other hand, Bobby had heard how Geico could save him money on car insurance, so he switched and saved. So it was all good. Let's talk some hoops. So, Rudy, did you enjoy the Orlando Magic Shelvin Mack tweet this morning? Uh, I actually loved it because the, the this is no lie. The entire season, I've been obviously followed them on all social media platforms, and I wonder how the person running that account could could be positive about anything because the season has been an abject disaster. And they'll still tweet out like, "Hey, here's a loss, but coming up, you know, we got the Jazz on Friday night. Make sure you buy your tickets now." And you're like, "What? How do you how do you remain so positive?" So this this isn't new to me, but it's new to like everyone else that isn't a, like a Magic you know fan or following one of their accounts. And it's just hilarious. Like I think it's actually kind of funny. I don't think the guy meant it to be funny, but it is funny. So I, you know, listen, I laughed it off. It's obviously terrible. Hopefully, it's the last season that they have to deal with this crap roster. I don't know. Who knows? I sent a DM to the whoever it is, and I, I imagine it's multiple people that do the Sacramento Kings Twitter feed. And that, in a way, I mean, it's been more embarrassing than Orlando, but kind of the same here. But at least the but Kings, like you know, it's just been you know the Kings have been like this forever. You got to kind of tell some jokes. The Magic like thought this was going to be a good season. It was obviously a huge disappointment. And how to just even be positive night in night out, like in Game Seven 60, and two, you're going nowhere. Were they seven and two, and they totally changed how they way they play? And Vogel was totally well, changing they, the way he coached. Well, they just stopped hitting threes. Really, was it? Yeah, and then Vucevic right. got hurt. I'm not even sure he's any good. Who knows? But we don't right. want to talk about. But that no, it, it was from the Ma- Magic feed. I follow him for some reason. I think maybe I follow some of the team feeds that follow me. And, you know, I was like, yeah, appreciate the support. Let me throw a follow your way, big guy. Um, male, female, all equal. Who knows who's running the sites? Both are very capable genders of doing it. Um, and it said, season leader, Shelvin Mack, led the Magic with 3.9 assists per game. So that's the graphic. But it's just, I think that because it had at Shelvin Mack with the dimes as the headline of the, like, that was the, the, the writing. Those were the words, not the graphic. So, like, Shelvin Mack with the dimes, and you're like, wow, you know what's point nine. So I retweeted it because I just, in a way, I thought it was terribly awesome. Yeah, or, yeah, like it was just so funny to me that I'm like, yep, in. And then there's a little, what is that? Is that like an envelope from the Orlando Magic feed? That's like the winner of, <laughs> like leading this. Is there some? Is this me being old and not understanding what that envelope with the arrow in it is? Hold on, I have to bring it up now because I don't know what you're talking about. Right. Well, go to the Orlando Magic feed, unless they're giving out all their season awards. And there's yeah, a guy that... The best think, part about it, though, was I that... I think it's a ballot, like a season... I, you know what? I should stop talking, because I've been known to get some of this stuff wrong. Hold time on, hold on, hold on. This the, is when the you best go part from, like, about it, though... Okay. No, oh, no, no, the envelope. Yeah, like this just in, maybe? Is that what that is? I don't know. Put I it mean, in. I mean, as long as you're on record with me, maybe not knowing, or it's worth overthinking it, and it's simply just that. Yeah, I don't know what envelope. that is. Because, I mean, I don't want another... You weren't shooting me with, you know, shooting in the gym. You weren't with me shooting in the gym. I don't need another fiasco like that. You rose that's, that's, that's one of the all-timers. Well, Ooh. you know what's good about that, though, is that I actually, if you gave me, like, a couple Ooh. guesses, I don't know if Shelvin Mack would have been the guy that I took as leading the Magic in assists. So it was actually kind of informative. If you ask me this year, hey, who led the Magic in assist, I would just say, shoot me. I would probably <laughs> go, I, okay. Hey, you have to get this right to be alive. I <laughs> go, okay, just, just kill me. It would have been funny if it was actually Alfred Payton, even though they traded him. No, see, I think that's the problem. Is, or, you know, if we were on to do it that way, all right, didn't think we were going to do this. Didn't think we were going to leave Way the too NBA much step. magic. Talk. Way too much magic early here. Terry Stotts, maybe next coach, who knows? My guess, I love Terry Stotts. Take him in a heartbeat. Um, oh, man, remind me to do a little couple minutes on Portland here, but. My guess would be that this is they were doing this because it's the end of the season, right? So I'm sure yeah. for the year, Alfred leads it in assists. I don't know, oh. three point nine. Alf- well, yeah, he had to have actually. Yeah, come on, yeah, he had six. All right. So there you go. There you go. Shout out to Shelvin Mack. Shout out. I, you know what? Not gonna lie, I've always been a Shelvin Mack fan. There you go. Boom. Said it. I have a team that picked him up. I called him. I said, "Hey, this is," and the guy's like, "Did you really call me to just?" Like praise me for bringing in the third point guard. I was like, I've always kind of liked him. I've always kind of liked him. I know who he is. I know he's not going to be your starter. You know, like Bill Simmons once said to me, he goes, you know, I think people it, sometimes look at you as Alex Smith and they go, we can do better than this. And I went, that doesn't feel like a compliment. I go, I think I have better numbers than Alex Smith. 
And he was like, no, no. He's like, I think Alex Smith is really good. I go, yeah, but you're saying it to me. You're saying it to the guy that used to argue that Alex Smith isn't as good. So, like, I'm not taking it as a compliment. Yeah, to me, this would be a great thing. I'd be like, oh, awesome. Thank you. Right. I love and Alex Smith. Bill was like, I don't think you're Alex Smith. He goes, I just think other people have thought you were Alex Smith and we can do better. So, somehow we turned me into Shelvin Mack. All right, moving on. Um, the playoffs. Dun, 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 dun. I don't know what the hell is going to happen in the Cavs Pacers. I heard the Will Kane show and I agree with... Saruti, yes, the Pacers nice. screwed that whole thing up. Like, get a bucket there. It wasn't like the Cavs were killing you and came back and won that game. I mean, honestly, the fact that Cavs are up 17 in the third quarter of game three and then blow that lead and lose game two, like, that could have been the, well, that's going to be the end of the Cavs thing. And as we see it, Saruti, as I've said in the entire time, despite I am still in, he is staying in Cleveland. And I think he is staying in Cleveland until... They get blasted in the playoffs, and then part two of that isn't just losing in the playoffs to somebody. And I don't know if that's this round or if that's the NBA Finals, but if it's a if it's a loss in the playoffs, which it will be, because I don't think they're winning the whole thing. I don't think that's breaking news. And then in this arms race that's going to be the Kawhi chase all summer, if they don't get him, and we can get in all that stuff if you want to, then it's going to be like, all right, well, maybe he's out of there. And then people say, oh, we should have seen it against the Pacers in that series. And I don't think it'll be decided solely on how this looks. But it looked really bad again last night. They don't box out. There's two different, there's two types of people in this world. There are people that have seen Jeff Green play. And then there are the people who have not seen Jeff Green play who think he's good because they see the one dunk a week. Okay. And then they, the new fan base gets Jeff Green. And then they tell the people that have seen Jeff Green and know who Jeff Green is. They say, no, no, you're wrong. And you go, wait a minute. I'm the one that dated Jeff Green. I know his deal. And then they come back to you a year later and they go, Hey, you know what? You were right about Jeff Green. So, uh, yes. Back to the original point there, Srudi, I think that the Pacers lost the series in game four in those those that three or four minute stretch there. And I heard people talking about, oh, like the Pacers have controlled this series. I don't know. The, the, the Cavs blew two like massive leads in two games three and four. Leads. Like, I don't know. I just I don't know. I don't know if the Pacers are clearly controlling the series. Like, I, you know, and honestly, LeBron's probably just going to break the tie for most things. And now do I expect LeBron to lose two out of three games? No, I don't. So that's that's why I thought that. No, and I think that it's really easy to beat up on Lou here if you want to. And I don't think Ty Lou's a great coach. Okay, I, ju- I just don't, and he'll be gone next year. Breaking. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I, he will be. I mean, when they redo this whole thing, if LeBron stays and all that, Lou will be out of there. And what I would ask for is, you know, if you could be really close with LeBron and be like, well, did you want Lou in there because he wasn't black? Because you guys are super annoyed with Blatt. And Blatt was kind of annoying too because he was very insecure about it and was trying to, you know remind everybody how accomplished he was and he's incredibly accomplished but the the american guys could give a bleep they're like oh, whatever dude you know like good congrats on your cups your uefa cups right see that was a little van pelt saruti joke with Rosillo back in the day so black gets out lou understands it lou understands time out of timeout tendencies you know of other coaches and that kind of stuff or you would hope so because he's in that nba life but i'm not going to just totally go against lou here even though like i'd say with lebron i'd go do you want somebody that's going to challenge you and piss you off and make you a little uncomfortable from time to time? Because that's probably what you need, all right? Or do you constantly want to be in control of everything and get to kind of like not have to listen to anybody? And I think that's what LeBron wants, but he probably needs the other thing more. Um, and I don't know if that's ever going to work out with a coach here. But Lou has had all of these injuries in the second half of the season with all of these new pieces. And so when you watch the Cavs, you see a team that still has no idea what to expect from anybody else. You just see that. You see a group that doesn't really trust anybody, doesn't even forget trust, doesn't really know anybody else's tendencies, and yet there's still 2-2 here with this whole thing. So I'm not going to totally beat up on Lou and say, oh, all the lack of rotation and these guys not being comfortable, that's all on him. He's trying to figure it out as he goes along. I give him credit for taking Tristan out of Game 3 and seeing if this thing's going to work, because guess what? It looked like it was great when they got up that huge lead, because you go, Tristan, in this matchup, chasing Turner around isn't really great. And Tristan... It's just, it, it, that's how quick this game has changed. In a couple years, you're like, he's the difference in some of these Golden State games because Golden State can't do anything with him. To whereas now you're like, I can't put him on the floor in certain matchups. So, you know, I'm not really telling you anything that you haven't heard before with this whole thing. And in one minute, I go, you know, maybe Cleveland still wins the East. And then last night when it looks like they're going to go down 3-1 and Oladipo still isn't even playing that great of a game and nobody's boxing out, the Cavs are still screwing up defensive rotations. And for all of you Cavs homers that came after me about LeBron being good on defense, like, you know he's on Thaddeus Young last night, right? 
You know, you like, are you paying attention to who he's matched up on? Now you're going to tell me he's tired and he played a million minutes. I already know every excuse before you even get out of your mouth. All right. I already know the whole deal, but they played four games in eight days with two days off between game one and game two. So like, even though you're going over 40 and LeBron has the least amount of help probably since that Spurs final series 11 years ago. You know, it's just a messed up team that could still come out of the East. But like the more I look at it, Saruti, like I think the Sixers thing is totally feasible. Like I, I you know, I, I'm more surprised at what they've become from where I thought what they would be as a new team that never played together. I'll be now less surprised from the start of the playoffs to seeing them come out of the East. Because there are scores everywhere. So there's seven or eight guys other than Amir and Justin Anderson. Everybody else can make a shot. And everybody else can make a shot that isn't solely dependent on somebody else getting them that shot. And even though I don't love the Heat, and the Heat have the longest num- number of like players where I go, Oh my God, that guy sucks. And then the second game, I'm like, you know what? That guy's kind of good. And then he sucks again in game three. So I'm not even sure how good they are. But that's why when I look at the Cavs, I look at the Cavs through the prism of Not just against the Pacers, but what about the rest of the East? And now I keep getting back to the Sixers going, you know what, dude? Those fourth quarter closing problems, like it's only really shown up once in this series. Assess. I'm going to probably just go down with the ship and I'm going to be that guy. I I think the East being so wide open makes me think LeBron and the Cavs are more likely to win the East. And like that's, that's, that's proving the fact that they will probably just end up winning the East again. Like I, I, they're going to win the series with the Pacers, I think. Um, you know the Sixers matchup is sexy, but I don't know. Like I, LeBron, like is he really going to lose to that team? Like I just maybe in the future, and I, like I'd love to see it happen because I think it'd be awesome to see like Simmons and these guys just like not give any bleeps about like seniority and it's my turn. Like they just go in and in their first playoff run, they go and win the East. That'd be incredible. I just can't see that happening. But see, you know what I love about Philly here too is okay. We've always talked about their length and how they have all these defenders. And B didn't even play well in Game Four. Miami is trying to punk them. Miami is like beating up on them, and Simmons isn't having it. Like Simmons is like, whatever, dude. I get it. Like that's that's so impressive. And then you go, okay, so wait a minute, who's coming off the bench now? And you're like, all right, Bellinelli and Ilya Sova, who for whatever reason feels criminally underrated for his entire career. Like every time I kind of see him, I'm like, man, he's huge. He can shoot. He can rebound. He's not soft. Like why is Ilya Sova on a million teams? Um. Although I did think it was funny that some Sixers media guys were arguing with me saying, oh, you know, good guy. I mean, it happens to me every time. And then, like, if I compliment him, it's like, oh, didn't you do this? And then if I say something like, hey, they're fourth quarters I don't like, then it's, oh, you're still trying to find a narrative negative spin. And you're like, dude, you're not even, you're not paying attention to any of this stuff. And then when I pointed out the fourth quarter struggles, they're like, well, it's a completely different team, moron, with Bellinelli, Ilyasova. And then I'm like, wait a minute. So if it's a completely different team, then I'm totally off the hook for not thinking they made any good because they're totally different now than the team that started the season, huh? I'm like, oh, that was good. You've yeah, done this really, before. Really no comeback there. Yeah. Like, well, you told me it was a completely different team and that all my fourth quarter stats are stupid. So that gets me off the hook for the debacle. I had some dude from Ethiopia lighten me up. All right. Uh, moving on. Mm, what else did I have here? I can't wait for Russ versus uh, Rubio. But the thing is, is like people can sit there in game four and say, oh, Russ, you know, Rubio lit him up. Russ said it's never going to happen again. First of all, that is, that is the, uh, that is the culture right there. That is, not liking the idea that a, that a Spaniard lit you up and, you know, they were up 20 on them like that. I mean, you want to talk about a stretch. Uh, but what's Westbrook going to do? Are you going to try harder? I mean, Westbrook plays basketball like a top in the living room and you have a kid and a lot of you guys probably don't play with tops anymore. I don't think I did, but you know what I'm saying, right? You spin the thing, you let it go. And sometimes it does some amazing, like really cool thing. But at the same time, like you're sort of at the mercy of whatever direction it goes in. And so, like, to make it do something different, would you spin it even harder? Like, no, you don't know what the hell's going to happen. So for Westbrook to say in a game four, like, this is never going to happen. Like, what are you going to do? Like, his his effort level is through the roof. I think his effort level on defense leads to him making tons of mistakes sometimes. And then he just gets super mad. But, like, what is he going to do? Dribble harder into traffic and try to make plays? So, I, you know, that's, like, that's different. Like, I always know he's keyed up and he's intense and he's super competitive. So... You know, but that's another one of those series where I go, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen because that third quarter in game, uh, game two, where you know the Jazz are right there with them, and the third quarter the Jazz didn't score. It felt like for like nine minutes, it was awful. And then I go, all right, well, playoff rule, who has more scores? All right, well, Oklahoma City has more scores. They've got Westbrook, they've got Paul George, and you know, I know everybody hates Melo, but like he can still get buckets. 
uh, in this game. And then I go the other side. It's Donovan Mitchell, who's a rookie. I like Jingle Juice as much as the next guy. You know, O'Neal's a hell of a story. But, you know, you're going, oh, man, you know, the Jazz aren't going to beat these dudes. They got one score and he's a rookie. And then Mitchell decides at the end of the third quarter, screw this. I've had it. And then what he did to close out that game, too, was nuts. And then you go, all right, I'm going to count how many bad Westbrook shots we have here to close. Oh, here's a few. And so, you know, I still look here's like all you guys that think that I hate the Thunder. I don't. I just I don't trust them ever. So I could still think they were going to beat the Jazz because the Jazz have one score and they have three. But that's another series I don't know what to do with. You know, I don't know what to do with Milwaukee and Boston. Milwaukee traded for two different players. Their their deadline was after Game Two, and they traded for Thon Maker and Jabari Parker. And Parker went from somebody who wasn't good when he came back from the ACL thing. So don't tell me like, oh, he wasn't good just because of the ACL. Well, he wasn't good, and that's why Prunty wasn't playing him, who probably could update his look. But I don't have any hair, so I'm not going to say that. But I just I look at that that Bucks team and go, well, this is a completely different team, and maybe it's just at home, but I think it's more than that than the team that they played at Boston, where Boston's like, oh, it's Brad Stevens and Rozier, and that'll be enough with Horford, and now all of a sudden Henson, who I'd never wondered if he was, I was like, is he actually any good, or am I just being a jerk? You're like, okay, now you're not going to play him. So that's a massive amount of rambling there. Uh, Saruti, so if any, you want to put any, uh, bumpers on any of that, yeah. you let me know, but. I couldn't believe how forgiving, I guess, is maybe the word you were of Mello. Like, he looks just done to me. I, I don't know if you could, I can't, I can't rely on him for anything. All right. Think. You're right to point that out. Like, that, that was a very passive compliment. Like, I, I look at, I look at it. I'm not an anti Mello guy either. No. I just, I just, I don't, <laughs> I mean, game I just two, the this... end of game two is horrific. No, no, he's bad. He's bad. Because he's not, he's not moving that well. And I don't think he knows how to fit in in this whole thing. And then we had Durant, by the way, like a, a, a thing about the Thunder weren't good because of Westbrook again. He did it again. Durant did it again. He liked something on Instagram. Um, that I try to, yeah. Which is always why I've said to you when everybody, everybody goes, because the Warriors blew the 3-1 lead and that Durant was like, oh, I can go ahead and do this. I'm like, dude, it was always happening. I believe everything I've been told from the very beginning of the Durant rumblings, which go back a ways. Even uh, if he won a title with the Thunder, like that's the there's no 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 right? no no no. If no the 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 spin on it, the narrative is that the Warriors hadn't blown the three one lead to the Cavs in 2016. Okay, so yeah, that Durant after that series, right? Whereas I had heard it, hey, there's a possibility that he's going to want to get out of there, and the reason was Westbrook. So, um, let's see, I had a couple other things in here. I did the Philly deal. Oh, the Anthony Davis stuff. Okay, I think you'll back me up here. I don't know if there's anybody at ESPN that likes Anthony Davis as much as me. Agreed? I'm trying to think. Probably Over the years? Uh... Remember how mad I got about the GM survey? Where I was like, oh, so yes. a year later, we're all Carl Anthony Towns, and now we all, like, yes. 11% are saying Davis. And I understand and that, that part really of that. And that seems really dumb now. Oh, my God, I know. Speaking like, I like Carl Anthony Towns, but he's not even close to that category. Both of those guys at our peak. I mean, that's, and that was, there was something I'd said at the beginning of this year, because Davis has been in the under 25 category for what seems like a decade. And you could argue, yes, he's been under 25 for 25 years. But, um, when it came out beginning of the season, it was Porzingis, it was Embiid, it was Giannis, it was Simmons. Although, you know, look, even at the beginning of the year, I don't think if it was the very, very beginning of the year, Simmons wasn't even being put on those things because we realized how sick the guy was going to be. Okay. So. I would say, hey, when it's healthy, you know, it's like it's Davis and my favorite catchphrase ever. It's not even close. But, you know, that's what I think of Anthony Davis when healthy. And I can like Towns. I love Embiid. I mean, love, love Embiid. I love his, per- I love that he's like, oh, you're going to push me around and stuff. Okay. Well, um, like you guys aren't like, you don't know, none of you can really do anything with me. Like Hassan Whiteside. Speaking of Whiteside, I can't wait to read the local feature in the paper for the new Whiteside team he's on that explains how misunderstood Hassan Whiteside is. Not using um, him right. Yeah, not using him right. Miami's fault. It's, you know, really good, really good, really good. And then they'll go, oh, wait a minute. The Vontez Perfect rule applies here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the Davis is so – all right, so fast forward to all the stuff that I saw this last week, and I know you guys are talking about it a little bit too, and that, okay, like, this is where you start really screwing these conversations up, Okay. You start looking at skill set and what is real and what his ceiling is, and it's an incredible sweep of a Portland team where you go, so wait a minute, I thought they were good on defense. I thought they fixed their defensive problems, and they were statistically in the second half of the season. And then you go, are there these things happening where the defenses look good and then they're fake good and then they stink in the playoffs? I mean, was it just a matchup thing, or is it like, again, 
where all of a sudden Thon Maker and Jabari Parker are good when you didn't expect it. Rondo's insane. Drew Holiday looks like a first-team All-NBA point guard, even though I've always liked him. He's never been healthy and, of course, took time off to take care of his wife, so you're not knocking him for that. But then you watch them and go, wait a minute, Miritich is sick now too, and he's banging with guys, and they have like this is this is so weird. Some of these teams that you go, why are we getting completely different playoff versions of some of these players? So back to my Davis thing, like you want to tell me he's more talented than Carl Malone, Charles Barkley, Kevin Garnett? I don't know, that one's a little tougher. You want to tell me he's more talented than some of those guys? I'd be willing to say Davis is maybe a top five talent this game has ever seen with all the different things he can do, and that he doesn't give you any, like he doesn't hurt you at all. He's a huge plus defensively, and all of his scoring is incredibly efficient. Like, he's insane how good he is. But it's so unfair to do this to the all-time guys when a dude had just, like, he was just a game away from winning his first ever playoff series. Mm -hmm. So skill, and then there's skill and accomplishment. And you can't start doing this thing like, you know, Lebetard show was talking about Simmons and Embiid, and they're going, two top five players of all time. (laughs) I don't think they were kidding. And they were kind of, you know, look, they weren't, they weren't saying, hey, Jordan, Kareem, Embiid, Bird, Simmons, but it was, hey, what, you know, what will Embiid and Simmons be? It, like, we're not that lucky, man. I mean, we don't have four of the top five all timers playing right now behind Jordan in LeBron. And then three other dudes that have no resume whatsoever. Well, like, do this for 12 years and let's see where we're going. Because, you know, for you youngins out there, you don't realize that Kevin Garnett was Chris Paul, but even worse. Garnett couldn't get out of the first round for almost a decade. And then he's the consummate winner. And when he was a total loser. Now, I never thought he was a loser, but it wasn't happening for him forever. It couldn't get out of the first round. had that one run with the Afro Puffs team. And... You know, it just, before we start claiming Davis is better than McHale, Barkley, and Carl Malone, I'll give you that skill set wise, he's probably beyond 99.9% of this league that we've ever seen. But you can't do that to dudes that have multiple rings. And I know Barkley and Malone don't, but are, you know, first ballot Hall of Fame, 15 years worth of contributions. Well, that's the thing is that I, we, it's not that they may be top five players of all time, but they're just guys that we have never seen before, right? Like we don't, we haven't seen somebody like Embiid with like the size and the skill that he's, that he's, that he possesses. Like, and I think it just confuses us because we're like, oh my goodness, he can pass, he can shoot. He's a great interior defender. He's a great perimeter defender. Like who, who in NBA history has ever been that? Nobody. Okay. He's the best player of all time. I, cause I, I was listening to first take and they had the argument is Kevin or is a, uh, is uh, Anthony Davis the second best power forward of all time be- behind Tim Duncan? And but they, the 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 way they were framing it was like just at his peak, his skill set is that the be- second best skill set of all time. I think you could make that argument, but you can't. Yeah, you can't put him all in as an all time great as far as like accomplishments because obviously he's not even going to come close to that. No, no, and that's always. But been I don't think it's Jordan ridiculous. Thing. I don't think it's ridiculous to say that his skill set is a top is a top two three power forward of all time. We're in agreement on that one, but like to be fair about all this stuff though, because you know, when you want to start doing let's do the time machine game and then you threw McHale into a game today, you know, I still don't think anybody would be able to guard McHale in the post, but would teams even dump it down to him in the post? Exactly. You know, they'd go, Hey dude, like sweet up and under armpit moves, um, which I'm a huge proponent of and still use. Uh, I think I have better post moves than most power forwards in the NBA. It's just, I'm, a shade under 6'2", because I think I'm shrinking because of my back from squats. Uh, how pissed off will people get at that last statement? Definitely really mad. Well, there'll, last... people, there'll be people that are pissed, and there'll be people that want benching updates at your new gym. Like, with guys. like Yeah, doing... so Garnett, Garnett getting out of the first round for the first seven years of his career. Couldn't get out of the first round. Goes to Boston. Wins a title. Uh, that was after nine years there. Let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That was eight years in Minnesota. And then he is the epitome of winning. The epitome of winning. That would be like Chris Paul winning a win, uh, winning with the Rockets, getting a ring here, playing another finals in two years, you know, like being in the finals mix three, four years straight and everybody saying in four years from now that Chris Paul is the absolute blueprint you want for a winning point guard. You would love that though. 
Um, I don't know. I still want to see this Warriors team do this. Cause, but I don't know, man. I mean, it's really weird. And I, I didn't think, I thought they'd leave San Antonio down, excuse me, down, uh, up 3-1, but I thought they'd lose game three. I really thought they'd lose game three because I just think they're a take the foot off the gas type of team. And it may come to bite them. And it's certainly biting Cleveland with their head. We'll just flip the switch defensively when the playoffs start. And you're like, hmm. Sure. I mean, they still screw up so many different things. Uh, yeah, so I was in Denver. I made it to the Air Force Academy. Check out um, their facilities. Shout out to Chris and I think Scott. I hope I have that right. Uh, I met Troy Calhoun, the head coach, for maybe four and a half seconds. Um, I talked to some of the guys that were in the program out there. Really good program if you can go play football at Air Force Academy and then stay in the military for a career afterwards. Like They were telling me all the breakdown of the stuff, and I was like, Ken, is it too late for me to sign up? Like, this sounds sick. Um, but I wasn't near like people, you know, I get back to Denver and guys were like, did you get on a plane? I'm like, no, no, we, I, I got a hat and a zip up, but I, yeah, they weren't, uh, we didn't, we didn't go out. We didn't go out and fly. Uh, so I just landed in LA not that long ago. Um, I don't know where I'm staying the next few days. So as soon as I get out of here, I got to figure out if I want to go back to where my gym is or if I want to stay on a different side. Um, I haven't done laundry in almost three weeks. Uh, and I don't know. I don't don't really have much more than that. I'm supposed to be able to move in my house May 1st. I'll believe it when I have a key. So you're just going to find a random hotel? Yeah, that's what I've been doing. I mean, I stayed at a friend's house in Denver, out in Cherry Creek. Uh, and I stayed with him for a bunch of days. And then he's, he's got like a three and a two year old and they're great. And this is, by the way, my friend Tim, who was uh, almost murdered in Colorado looking at a piece of land by this guy that's now wanted by the FBI who's on the 10 most wanted list I think I don't think he's national I think he's more of a local guy kind of like a non-power five most wanted and so he he almost murdered my friend he tried to murder my friend or he was setting him up to murder him and then take his identity and leave the country and my friend's going to tell us that story but he can't do it today today he's busy I think today's email day we make that joke because he's not always that busy because he does have a lot of stuff going on um, but the ironic part of the whole deal is that then when I went to the Rockies game, ran into Big Cat, and then Big Cat started oh, doing this thing, and it was a Cubs game, so he was getting, um, you know, asked for pictures more than I was, and he was loving it every minute of it. So Big Cat started doing the, hey, do you know who this is? And, and a girl lied. She's like, oh, yeah, Ryan. And I was like, yeah, Ryan Anderson, Houston Rockets. She's like, I know. And I was like, yeah. And then he thought it was the funniest thing, and then he kept doing it. And I actually thought it was funny, and then I think he thought I didn't like it. And I was like, no, dude, I don't I don't really care. Like, I'm fine. And then my friend jumped in and was like, oh, he cares. Rosillo cares. And then Big Cat was like, yeah, I knew it. I knew he cares. And then it was just my friend, and I'm like, why did you do that? And he's like, yeah, I know you didn't care. He's like, I just thought it was fun. He's like, I liked him. He's a good guy. I was like, yeah, he's a good guy. And so... Uh, yeah, I saw I Big Cat tweet out, like, now I understand why people moved to Denver. And I was like, hmm. Interesting connection there. Wonder yeah, we went to the game together. That was it. Nothing. It was pretty. Uh, it was a pretty tame week. Out. Yeah, it actually was a very, very tame. But the thing is, because I'd started the week staying with my friend at his house, and I knew I was going to stay there the whole time. Like I don't want to stay six nights with my friend because you know his wife who likes me, but she'd be like, "Come on, dude, he's here six days." But then I started like really helping out around the house, and then my morning routine was the three year old would would crawl into the guest room about five forty five six a.m. each day. And asked me to put on Paw Patrol or um, or Spider Man, and so that's what we would do. And he would just jump into bed. And then, like the the third morning, I was dying, like I hadn't slept at all. And I locked the door on him. And then I heard just kind of like a little crying, a little knocking at the door. And then I let it. I just like man, and I felt so guilty because I ignored it the first time. And then the second time, I was like, all right, I'll answer the door. And he's like, Are you? Did you not want to hang out today? And I was like, ah, oh, man. And that's how I realized how you know, like some of you parents out there just aren't great punishing people because they're so damn cute. You know what I'm talking about, Sir Not yet, thank goodness. All right, so that'll do it for me. Uh, I'll be back probably next week. Um, well, I will be back next week. Um, but I will uh, also... Uh, and I'm doing a big thing with uh, Bill on, on Thursday. So I'll do a, a ringer playoff thing. I think we're doing it the night of all the all the games, I think. That's the tentative plan. And then um, I'll do a little draft recap and... And maybe my friend who got murdered, almost murdered, almost murdered. It could be tougher to get him if he was. All right. Thank you. Subscribe, rate, review uh, to the podcast. Tell all of your friends to do the same. See you next week.